It is March 2024. I am with the Intercultural Leadership Institute cohort caravanning from Rapid City, South Dakota, through the Badlands to the Oglala Lakota Art Space on Pine Ridge Reservation. We are greeted with ceremony and song. We settle into gracious hospitality. Coffee, water, snacks are in hand, and we are guided into a classroom where we are met by Indigenous Ways educator, Helene Gaddy. Each person is given a black piece of construction paper, scotch tape, a sewing needle, and a map. Helene tells us we are going to make stargazers. Following her instructions, we use the map to create a cylinder with holes in it matching the constellations of the Lakota sky. On the lower left corner of the map is the Lakota territory, and on the upper right corner of the map is the stars. Lines draw connection from one to another. The Lakota map represents a place where sacred lands meet the stars. The Lakota belief what is on the earth is in the stars, and what is in the stars is on the earth, is beautifully depicted through this map. Then, Lakota culture bearers, Ruth Cedar Face and Janice Richards, present teepee teachings that depict a home, open to the top, displaying the dark night sky, where families learn the way of the stars. Each teepee pole, points to a star in the sky that represents a particular connection to that star's placement on the map and the tribal stories related to that particular star. Lakota star knowledge charts an intimate familiarity with the geography of the Black Hills and links that sacred place to the astronomy above. This kind of knowing of place and sky grows from a long abiding with land and cosmos. Generations of attentiveness to the stars teach the Lakota not only about the night sky, but also about themselves. Humans on earth are connected to the stars above, a connection honored with story and prayer and ceremony and a way of life. It develops a familiarity, a kinship that defies the laws of gravity and time and exchanges them for a spirituality, a way of life that is deeply rooted in sacred attentiveness and relationship. Bearing witness to Lakota star knowledge awakens in me a memory of a poem by Ada Limon entitled Dead Stars. Here's a portion of it. We point out the stars that make Orion as we take out the trash, the, the rolling containers, a song of suburban thunder. It's almost romantic as we adjust the waxy blue recycling bin until you say, man, we should really learn some new constellations. And it's true, we keep forgetting about Antilia, Centaurus, Draco, Lacerta, Hydra, Lyra, Lynx, but mostly we're forgetting dead stars too. My mouth is full of dust and I wish to reclaim the rising, to lean into the spotlight of the streetlight with you toward what's larger within us, toward how we were born. I want this kind of way of knowing. I want this kind of attentiveness, this kind of intimacy with the creation and creator. But the way that I was born into and the way that I imagine most of you were born into is very distant from the map of the Lakotas. Walking outside at night, I would have to trek a long while before finding any semblance of dark. Looking up at the night sky, we might be lucky to just see a handful of stars and not many of us would know their name or their connection to stories or to lands or to ourselves. Light pollution, towering buildings, expanding development, fossil fuel fumes, airplanes, satellites, they block the view of the stars and all sorts of distractions block our knowledge of their stories. Living in a way that reflects the value that people are re relative, that we are mutually connected and related to all creation, 
requires us to confront the obstacles blocking our way. Obstacles like overconsumption of resources, exploitation of people and land, competition, and greed. We know in our gut, and because many of our beloved guides proclaim a similar message, we are all in some way products of an exploitative society, and it would be foolish to pretend otherwise. There's no way around it. We have to admit it. The Western way, the American way, the Charlotte way, the colonizing way, the patriarchal way, the imperialist way, the individualist way is very distant from the sacred way. As much as we might be enamored with the idea of harmony and holistic relationship with God's ecosystem, what continues to grow in our society and in our psyche at a rapid pace is an expanding market, an exploitative economy, an all-consuming culture of outdoing one another, outdoing ourselves, and outdoing our planet. We have gotten in a habit of thinking from the perspective that what is good for me and mine will be good for the world. But we've got to turn ourselves around. Some might even say, repent and come to understand what is good for the world will be good for us. In their book, Journey to Elohe, How Indigenous Values Lead Us to Harmony and Well-Being, indigenous theologians Randy and Edith Woodley write, living within this kind of false reality has consequences. We think of the planet as something separate from us, as, as if it's in trouble. But in reality, we, the human species, are the ones in grave danger. The Lakota way is very distant from my own, yet it inspires me to reflect, reflect deeply and to learn from their wisdom. It shows me that there is another way, and it prompts me to wonder, what might I learn from the Lakota people and take home to my corner in West Charlotte? For, now, for a while now, I have been working on a series of maps, a map of the neighborhood, a map of myself, a map of healing elements I find there. Here's how it all got started. On a large table tabletop, I took a canvas and I sketched the roads of the neighborhood. And then I appointed certain symbols and colors to represent things on the map. The daily walking routes that I have with me and my dog named Brother, those are marked with little dashes. The color blue represents a significant place on the map. Yellow represents significant people. Green represents healing elements like particular plants that make me feel alive. The reddish orange color represents my own sense of pain in a place. And fuchsia represents loss. With paint and water, I wash these entities onto the map. Then I cut out each one of the blocks one by one out of the map, and I used paper and cloth and color to mark the map and those blocks with the houses and the structures and the memories there. After each block is complete, I sew the block back into the map. Each stitch is an effort to hold it all together, to remain connected, to repair the wounds, block by block, story by story, piece by piece, place by place, person by person, I mark memory and time and change into the map. The Lakota star knowledge map and the one that I make create a defiance of the laws of gravity and time. From where I stand on the map, I have one foot on Tuckasegee Road and one foot in the murky depths of loss. In my line of sight is an invisible memory of what once was and also a sign of what is coming. I am standing at an intersection on the map and I am the map itself. Parts of me are connected across time and places to the past, the soil of my upbringing, the elements that shape me. 
This map draws a line of relationship between me and the corner and the clover and the conversations and the catalpa and the, and the people around me. In this map making process, there is a deep knowledge that I am just now discovering, a deep knowing that is growing from a long abiding with land and people and cosmos, a familiarity, a kindredness, a relationship to place. And I am only just now skimming the surface. I feel immense gratitude for what I am learning of the story of God's creation on Tuckasegee Road. Robin Wall Kimmerer tells an Anishinaabe creation story in her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants. She says, it is said that the creator gathered together the four sacred elements, fire, earth, wind, and water, and breathed life into them to give form to the original man who was given the name Nanabozo. The creator called out the name to all the four directions so that the others would know that he was coming. And then the creator gave Nanabozo a task. Walk through the world in such a way that each step is a greeting to Mother Earth. He wasn't sure yet what that meant, but fortunately, there were other prints upon the earth, many paths to follow, made by all those whose home this already was. He explored the land. He learned lessons from the sun, the winds, the waters, the earth, and the beings. And then he was given a new task, to learn the names of all the beings. He watched them carefully to see how they lived and he spoke with them to learn what gifts they carried out in order to discern their names. And he began to feel more at home and was not lonely anymore because he could call others by name and they called out to him when he passed. Now, do you know the names of the plants and the animals around you? Don't feel bad. Most people don't. And it might feel a little bit silly, but I want you to try it. Hello, crepe myrtle. Hello, willow oak. How you doing, Nandina? How's it hanging, possum? The first human, Nanabozo, did not know the beings around him, but he was willing to learn. And he did not know his parentage or his origins, only that he was set down into a fully peopled world of plants and animals, winds and water. Before he arrived, the world was all there, in balance and harmony, each one fulfilling their purpose and creation. He understood that this was not his new world, but one that was ancient before he came. Nanabozo did his best with the instructions he was given and tried to become native to his new home. Now, what do you think when you hear this story? especially one that sounds so very familiar to our own creation story. Is the way of Nanabozo, or Adam, or Eve, is their way of knowing and relating to God and creation possible for us too? Is it possible for non-indigenous people to defy the laws we have been taught? Is it possible for settler society to become so familiar with land and sky and spirit that we, by way of life and spirituality, forsake old dogmas in exchange for a new and sacred way? Is it possible for us to become native to place? Robin Wall Kimmerer writes, now, against the backdrop of American settler society and history, an invitation to settler society to become indigenous to place feels like a free ticket to a housebreaking party. It could be read as an open invitation to take what little is left. Can settlers be trusted to follow Nana Bozo to walk so that each step is a greeting to Mother Earth? And then Kimmerer gives us a guide a new name to learn, and that is the plantain. The plantain is a low-lying, broad-leaf plant. Some of us might call it a weed, 
And we may very much at this very moment trying to be get rid, getting rid of it in, on our lawns. The plantain is not indigenous to U.S. land. It was brought over on the shoes of the first settlers and traveled with them across the country. Unlike many non-native plants, it is not invasive. You know, kudzu, kudzu is invasive. Plantain is not. Plantains do not take over. They, it, they coexist in the ecosystem and they provide medicinal benefits as well. Plantain is so well integrated that we have begun to think of it as native. It has even earned a new name bestowed by botanists for plants that have become our own. The plantain is not called indigenous, but it is called naturalized. If you look at the map, you'll see plantain at the corner of Tuckasegee and Parkway. You'll see some more at the bus stop. You'll see some more at the park and down by the coffee shop. On my walk, I'm gonna pass it by. Good morning, plantain, good morning. Hey, plantain, can you keep teaching me your wise lessons? I wanna live in a sacred way with you and God's creation. Plantain, can you show me how to be so integrated and so beneficial that I may live a new life, that I may be given a new name? Can you show me, Plantain, how to become naturalized to this place? Until recently, I've never put myself into my own artwork. My pieces have always been pointing to someone else, somewhere else, away from me. However, when I was working on this map, I began to realize just how much of myself was incorporated into the map making. I was marking my experiences on the map, my own memories of this place, my own relationships. And so, I decided to experiment with incorporating myself into my art. I drew self-portraits, and then using the same map legend, I began to mark where on my body I carry significant people, where on my body I carry significant places, where do I receive healing resources and salve? Where is there pain? Where is there loss? And with paint and water, I wash these entities onto myself. Green washes over me for the resources that feed me. Blue for the places that quench my thirst and fill my spirit. Yellow for the ancestors who lie in this ground and for the children who play in the soil. Fuchsia, for the ways I have strived to take care of the land as if our lives depend on it. Now imagine if we, all of us, were to create a map of our places and also of ourselves. And imagine if we sew this map, stitch by stitch, all together, yours and mine together, until the map begins to take the shape of Mecklenburg County, North Carolina, and maybe even further. In Western North Carolina, the mountains would be washed with the reddish hue of erosion, flooding of pain, the pink hue of grief and loss. Maybe our home places, our home churches might be washed with yellow for significant people we have loved or who love us. Where on, the, on your map would be the places shaded with silent stories one of pain, ones of violence or suffering? Which ones would be washed with tones of overconsumption or greed? What places on your map would be tinged with hues of poverty? The hue of grief and loss is bold and prevalent, bearing witness to economic oppression and exploitation and unjust disparities leaves unhealed wounds and scars on the neighborhood, on its inhabitants, including me, including you. Becoming naturalized a place means not turning our gaze from this pain. Full inhabitants with God's ecosystem, daily walking as if each step is a greeting to Mother Earth, 
We can no longer be blind or immune to what is wrong and wounded or scarred. Even though it is hard, even though we are losing ground, even though we, the wounds that we have inflicted on others are still fresh, even though the scars we bear on our own bodies and land are still tender, it is a necessary and sacred journey to become naturalized to place. Becoming naturalized to place, walking on the earth as if each step is a greeting to Mother Nature, discovering and rediscovering our connection to creation and to God is a holy and lifelong work. By attuning our minds and bodies to God's presence, our surroundings, our inner thoughts, and the world around us, we begin to sense the interplay and interdependence between ourselves and the world. And this realization informs our values and actions. When we grow a holistic understanding of our relationship with God and Creator, our values shift toward the good of God's whole creation. The spiritual practice of becoming naturalized a place gives us an inner strength and fortifies a mutual network of care. This practice is a healing salve. It is a community builder. It is an endurance strengthener. It is a resource for change. Making connection sparks liberatory imagination. God's spirit breathes new imagination, introducing us to healing resources we weren't aware of and possibilities of repair that we never pictured. Ecologist Wes West Jackson states, becoming native or naturalized to one's place means making everything from the domestic livestock to our domesticated plants, making them native and naturalized too. And this is a very long process. It is a long process to connect the groceries we buy to the farmer who grew them, to the bank we use, to the workers' wages, to the fossil fuels, to our gut health, to our life expectancy, to the life expectancy of others. It is a long process to connect the map of my body to the map of yours, to the map of my neighborhood, to the map of the Badlands, to the map of the Lakota stars. It is a long process to connect the fiery dust of the universe to the dust breathed into life, to the dust in our lungs, to the dust at our feet. It is a long process to connect the story of the Anishinaabe people to the ancient story of Adam to our story. It is a long journey from Myers Park to my neighborhood on the west side. It is a long journey from the shores of the Atlantic to the shores of Gaza. It is a long distance from the plantain to the cypress, from the olive tree to the crepe myrtle. It is a long line to draw from the stars of the universe to the streets of our cities. But I can see it on the map. There is a way towards sacred connection. The Lakota have a saying, what is on the earth is in the stars, and what is in the stars is on the earth. Our faith has a similar one, on earth as it is in heaven, with our lands, with our bodies, with our lives, with all of creation, may it be so. May it be so. Amen.